War Report family, we're back with another great edition of Building Report. Today's guest is very special to us. Uh, Coach Stephen Pearl of Auburn Basketball joins us. Coach, how's it going? Mike, Ike, I'm good. Stephen, I want to get the interview kicked off talking a little bit about what it's like being the son of a great coach. Uh, your dad has accomplished a lot. You know, um, he's now in his second stint in the SEC at Auburn. Uh, you know, he had some success at Tennessee, taking them to the Sweet 16. And now you're at Auburn, and you've got a Final Four under your belt. Auburn is producing first-round draft picks. What's it like uh, having a dad as a great coach and being able to learn under his tutelage? It's an interesting dynamic because, you know, you're, you're known as Bruce Pearl's son, you know, uh, but it's uh, it's been fun. You know, having played for him at Tennessee, having seen the success that, you know, you know I, I, we had on the court um, as a player and now having been working for him for the past nine years and kind of seeing what we've built here, um, you know, it's been a lot of fun. It's, um, you know, as a player, didn't realize all the intricacies and everything that went into what he did as a coach. But now being on this side of it, seeing, you know, the amount of work he puts into it on and off the floor, it just gives me a different level, you know, of respect. And we've kind of just been, we've kind of seen each other as like, you know, he's been my coach, but for the past nine years, he's really just been like, like, like a best friend, like a brother, more than, more than a dad, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, ha having worked together. So yeah, he, he was a hell of a lot harder to play for than he is to work for. So <laughs> Uh, I, I understand that when our guys get frustrated and get upset sometimes, um, haven't been there and haven't done that. So, but it's been a lot of fun and, and having do having to do it at a place like Auburn has made it way more special just because one, it hadn't been done before, you know, having won three championships in five years, having gone to a final four, um, that's new history. And that's something that the Auburn family, you know, is obviously locked into and, and really cherished and appreciated and poured into with this program, with these kids and with this coaching staff. So it's been an unbelievable run, but obviously, you know, we still got work to do. Now you talked about him being a lot harder to play for um, than to work under. Uh, what's that? Do, do you guys disagree a lot when it comes to coaching or like, you know, what, what are those conversations like when you see something different than he sees? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a healthy disagreement, but we disagree on a lot of things. But that's just because we want to try and figure out what's the best way of doing things, whether it's in recruiting, whether it's in game planning, whether it's in roster management. <clears throat> we go back and forth, you know, as a staff, because that's the best way to obviously figure out, you know, what the best solution is. Because if you just have a bunch of yes men on your staff, you know, that's not going to get anything done. So coach wants opinions from everybody. He wants, you know, that, that rapport, that back and forth for us to, you know, come to a good conclusion. So, um, you know, as a, as a player, you can't disagree with anything because you're a player. Right, so right. you, you just got to wear it, right? <laughs> now, as a, as a coach, I can we can go back and forth a little bit, you know, which is new for me. So, um, but not, it, it's a healthy dynamic. But, you know, he and I do, you know, we, we do tend to go back and forth on a lot of things just to come to, you know, come to the best conclusion that helps us be successful. Uh, Coach Pearl, I, I want to ask you about two different experiences that you've had since being an Auburn coach, and that is traveling back to Knoxville to be a coach there, right? What's that experience like for you? You've done that a couple of times. And then this year, a brand new experience on the opposite side, coaching against Todd Golden. What were those two kind of things like for you? Just kind of two different worlds meeting right there on the basketball court. So, I mean, first off, the, the Tennessee thing is, is, is an interesting one. Um, and I think people get confused. People think, like, what's it like playing at your alma mater? I'm like, it's pretty simple. Like, I don't like those guys. They fired us. You know, we made mistakes, but we got fired. You know, I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't exactly treated like an alumnus when I when I when I left there. So, okay. um, yeah. you know, what I mean, like, but I also understand the dynamic of the situation was sensitive because we had done some things that we shouldn't have done and we got fired for them, which I completely, you know, I get now, you know, you have a barbecue at your house. You know, you, you could buy a barbecue restaurant for a kid now. But, you know, <laughs> we, we got fired for having a barbecue right. at, at Tennessee. Right. So, um, no, it, it, it's uh, it's it's tough. Because, you know, obviously I still have a lot of friends in Knoxville. Mm. A lot of the fans I'm still really close with. They, you know, they're obviously big supporters of mine when I was playing. Um, so it's hard in, on that standpoint. But as far as a competitor goes, like, you know, I'm, I'm all in on Auburn. And that, I'm an Auburn man now. And that's, that's you know, I wish I could have my degree from Auburn, to be completely honest mm. to you. Hey. I, wear that on my, I, I wear that on my chest now. And that's just, you know, that's what it's always – that's what it's been. And that's what it's going to continue to be. So, um, 
that I want to beat Tennessee more than anybody, you know, even as much as Alabama. So when I go back there, you know, obviously we've lost two close ones there, but before that we had won like six in a row against Tennessee. So right. you know, we've had great success and it's obviously a big game on our schedule. So it's tough because you see a lot of people like you see the, the, the ushers that, that take people to their seats. Like those people were all there when I was at Tennessee, the janitors, the mm -hmm. people that were there mm -hmm. with me late at night when I was getting shots up, like those people are all still there. So like, it's great seeing them. You know, you see people like donors that you were really close with uh, that gave you summer internship jobs, like picking weeds, like, you know, that type of, you see those people and like, you still got love for those people, obviously. Right. But at the end of the day, when you get between those lines, like, you know, I'm trying to beat them every single time. And, you know, I put a lot of work into that scout because it's important to, to us. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that so people are like, why do you want to beat Tennessee so bad? They fired us. That's why. So, <laughs> okay. I, I, um, I like the energy though. Hey, that's it. yeah. honest. That's honest. No, um, no. So I, uh, I try to keep it real on that on that subject. But then well, you know, switching gears to to Todd, that that one was 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 difficult because Todd's you know one of my my closest friends. You know, we consider each other family. Um, obviously, like when he was at San Francisco. Uh, you know, I cheered. I, I was up late at night watching all their games, just wanting them to be successful and have success. Obviously, he was on the staff with us for two years. Where we, we became really close. We played together in Israel. We played together in Australia in the Maccabi game. So a lot of history there. Um, and then, you know, funny story, like we're playing Jacksonville State in the first round of the tournament last year. Mm -hmm. And my Apple Watch is synced up to my phone, which is in the locker room. And I get the ESPN report that Todd Golden is the new head coach of mm -hmm. Florida. And we're in the huddle, I was like, the coach's huddle, and I said, holy, you know. And BP was like, what? And I was like, no, nah, nothing. don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Because like, we're <laughs> trying to, you know, focus on second half adjustments. So I see he gets the job, and, like, I knew he was interviewing for a few few jobs, but I didn't realize that it was that close to actually happening. So he gets the job, and then obviously, like, you know, it, it, it's, it's mixed because you're happy for him, but then you're like, damn, yeah, I got to compete go against this guy in recruiting. Yeah. You got to compete against him, you know, once or twice a year, maybe three times if you play him in the SEC tournament. So – that, that was tough um, preparing for that game, getting ready for that game. Obviously, you know, same same thing goes, though. When you step in between those lines, like we're trying to beat Florida by 20 points, right? Yeah. Like that's 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 the mindset, and that's what it will always be. But I, I'd be lying if I said I, it wasn't, like, bittersweet at the end to, like, see them have – they put an unbelievable game plan together. Honestly, they probably should have beat us. Um, we made some plays down the stretch that obviously allowed us to win the game. But, like, I thought they outplayed us. In, in some regards, they, he, he outcoached us. Uh, in some of their sets, they ran out of timeouts. He did an unbelievable job. Yeah. Um, so obviously, I'm happy we won, but it was tough to see him go through such a tough loss because, you know, you could tell that they wanted that one badly. But at the end of the day, like obviously, you know, thrilled that we that we got the W. So, but I'm really happy we played that game first play first game of the SEC season. So mm -hmm. then now we can you know exchange notes and scouting reports on on these other teams trying to help each other get some wins. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen, I'm I'm sensing a level of petty in you that. I really I have, like listen, <laughs> you, you know you might not watch the war report. I appreciate every yeah. bit of pity that I just oh, yeah, right. that's my kind of stuff right there. I like yeah, it. I'm sensing a level of you, you never want to see your ex doing better without you, right? Like that's so right. the 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 love the, the, the want to beat Tennessee certainly. Uh, I gotta ask, is Auburn Auburn's Auburn's a better program than Tennessee right now, right? Like they're a better program. You guys are just better, right? Yeah, I mean, you look at you know over the last six years the success that both programs have had and honestly like i would say it's very comparable we've had mm -hmm. more success i would say we've had a little more success we've won more championships they've won two we've won three we've been to a final four they haven't gotten past this you know the first week they got to the sweet 16 a couple years ago so That's comparatively best. i would say yeah we've probably had a little more success in tennessee but as far as like where both programs are right now like tennessee and auburn are both you know and you know, you, you could say Tennessee, Auburn, Alabama are the three best programs in the SEC right now over the past six years, you know, which, which right. is which is a crazy thing to say when you're not including the likes of Kentucky, the likes of Florida, you know, those mm. types of programs that were so dominant for so long, you know, when I was playing and then over the past, you know, 15 years. So um, but I, I would say they're very comparable. If you look at the numbers though, we probably got a slight edge on them on in rings and just, you know, uh, what we've done in the tournament. Steven, let's switch gears and talk about the dichotomy of this year's team. Uh, no Jabari Smith, no Walker Kessler. You guys have had to replace a lot of production uh, from that standpoint. So Auburn is in a unique position uh, that they have not been in the past in that you're having to replace first round draft picks every year now, seemingly. How hard mm -hmm. is that from a development standpoint? 
to continue to lose those guys year after year and have to replace them? And, you know, what are you guys doing, you know, from a development standpoint to try to fill those gaps uh, and, and make sure that you can replace that production year after year? I mean, Mike, it's, it's a great problem to have when you've had six draft picks in the last four years. Like you obviously, you know, you don't want to lose guys like Isaac Okoro after one year, but that would have meant that we would have had to go 25 and six that year and have had a great year. And if, you know, if it wasn't for COVID, like I think that team could have gone back to the final four because we had five seniors plus Isaac, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I think that team could have made a run too. You, know, you look at Chumo Kiki, you know, we, we, we go to the final four and he plays great. Our last, you know, 10 games before he gets hurt, you know, we have to have a special seat. So you lose players because you have special seasons. Jabari Smith, Walker Kessler, special season you know those two guys were unicorns right um to lose those guys and then the hardest part is having to replace them like how do you replace them but continue to be successful so um you know once we knew jabari was gone you know we knew that was going to happen we knew he was a, a lottery pick a top five pick walker was you know kind of 50 50 for a while trying to figure out do i go do i come back have a more dominant offensive role continue to be the national defensive player of the year he made a good decision. You know, he goes 22, you know, he's in the running right now for rookie of the year with Paulo. Right. Right. And uh, you know, he's in the rising stars game, him and Jabari are both in the rising stars game this weekend in Salt Lake city for, for the all-star weekend. They're both in the skills competition. So like you know, we lose two studs, right? So you got to go out and find guys to replace them. Obviously Jalen Williams um, backing up Jabari last year, playing only eight or 10 minutes a game. He could have started on most sec rosters last year. Right. So we felt good about him coming back and, and being able to step into a bigger role. Um, but then obviously you still got to find someone to split those minutes. So we, we, we try and go get a really talented freshman and Yoan who could play four or five um, trying to figure out where his best position is. And then after that, we had to hit the portal really hard. Once Walker told us at the final four that he was leaving. Mm -hmm. um, and sure enough, like it was wild. I was down there at a, a like a symposium and Walker basically told me that morning at the brunch that we went to where he got the player of the year award that he was leaving. Mm -hmm. Janai Broom enters the portal like an hour later. So oh, wow. I'm obviously like, you know, devastated that Walker who I brought here from North Carolina, who I helped bring here is leaving. But now it's like, all right, I got to shift gears. I got to find somebody to replace this dude. So Janai gets in the portal, called Janai right away. I'm like, Hey, like, you know, explain the situation. And, you know, from there, we just started recruiting Janai. And, um, you know, over the next couple of weeks, found a way to, 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 get, to get it done with Janai. You know, he saw a lot of similarities about what he could do defensively. He was a top 10 in the country shot block rate guy, kind of like Walker was. Mm -hmm. um, you know, probably had a better, has a better low post game than Walker does in college. Sure. Yeah. Um, scores better around the rim. Um, so, you know, he saw the fit and he saw what the vision was for him. And then obviously having Dylan to back him up or, or even like compete with him this summer, um, you know, was, was obviously a huge benefit. So our front court, you know, we, we felt pretty good about that. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, we bring in a couple of really good guys, but you know, you're still not going to be able to be Jabari Smith and Walker Kessler. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so we knew that it was a tall task to have to replace those guys. We needed to lean on, you know, some of our returning guards to step up and have a bigger role. Um, so, you know, you look at, you know, where, where we're at now, right. We're 18 and eight, uh, eight and five in conference. You look at, you know, four of our last five losses, um, at West Virginia, you know, at, uh, at Tennessee, Alabama at home at Texas A&M, you know, we felt like we played good basketball in all those games, minus the first half of West Virginia. You know, we 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 should have won at West Virginia. Jalen Williams misses a layup on an and one. Wendell misses a reverse layup. You know, we had multiple chances to win that game uh, at Tennessee. We hold, you know, arguably analytically the the second best team in the country to 46 points on their home floor. We should win that game. You know, right, right. Um, at Texas A&M, you know, we played great and they shot 25 more free throws than us. We got to stop fouling. Like, that's a, too many self-inflicted wounds right there to allow a team to shoot that many more free throws than you. You're going to have a hard time winning, but we played well. And then Alabama, we lead for 30 minutes of that game um, and just don't make plays down the stretch, and, and we end up losing that game. So, one, we got to do a better job of guarding without fouling. We got to do a better job of closing games. But all in all, like, we're close, right? Yeah. I, I think this team's close to turning that corner. We just got to find a way to finish up. But then, you know – we tell our guys like this is a must win game on Tuesday against Missouri, a Missouri team that's won against four or five ranked teams this year, a team that's just went to Tennessee and won shorthanded. 
right? Mm-hmm. They're coming in here confident, thinking they're about to, you know, blow us out or do something. So we told our guys, this is a must-win game. Like, if you guys want to get into the tournament, like, we got to take care of business. They come out respond. We beat them by 33. Right. right. So this team is, you know, I think we're in a good spot. Um, you know, obviously, there's a lot of things that we need to do as a team to finish games better. We we recognize that. Uh, even with all the things that have gone against us on, on these games, we still controlled our own destiny in those games and we just didn't deliver. So right. we understand that regardless of whether it's a free throw discrepancy, whether it's, you know, Wendell not getting that foul at the end of the Tennessee game, like we still should have taken care of business before that for it not to come to that point. So right. uh, and our guys understand that and, and, you know, they've locked into that. So understand that these next, you know, these next couple are really important. We got to win. Um, and that's the mindset going in. Now, you brought up Texas A&M. I just want to jump back to that for a second. Uh, okay. The I, I know you. the message in the locker room will never be, oh, but the refs. But mm-hmm. from a fan standpoint, um, the uneven whistles seemed like it made it difficult for Auburn to play their game plan defensively when you've got Janai Broom out there just trying not to foul out because the whistles are so uneven. You know, mm-hmm. how do you, what do you, what do you say to the team when the game is being called seemingly not even in one direction and it's affecting how your guys play the game. At the end of the day, like you still have to be cognizant early in halves about fouling and don't mm-hmm. even give them the opportunity to call the foul because a, a foul early in a half is like a mistake. It's like a turnover because right. at that point you're getting closer to the bonus. Right. And then once they're at six, now you really can't do much you know, of the garden that we like to do as far as being aggressive and being, you know, physical because they're going to call it. And then now you're in foul trouble and now they're in the bonus. So we're not able to, so early in halves, we got to do a better job. And we tell our guys this, like early fouls are mistakes in both halves, especially the second half, because, you know, that's what the home team wants on the road is they want to try and, you know, get to the foul line early to try and slow the tempo down, especially when you're leading like we were. So we tell our guys like early in halves, no stupid fouls, um, nothing that the, the refs are going to be able to easy, you know, make easy calls on, uh, because like you said, like Janai had four fouls, Wendell had, you know, was in f- foul trouble. So like those guys aren't going to guard the same way, but we also tell our guys, like, you got to trust the guy that's behind you. Mm-hmm. So when you're out there with foul trouble, you can't be, you know, not guarding because it's going to make us lo- like, we lost, we lost the game because guys weren't guarding like they normally did because they're worried about foul trouble. You got to trust right. that Dylan's going to come in and be able to give us quality minutes behind you. Uh, you know, when obviously if you're in foul trouble, Wendell, you got to trust that Trey is going to be able to come in. You know, mm. so we got to tell our guys like trust the man behind you and guard as if you have one foul, not as if you have four. Mm. Okay. Hey, well, that's uh, that's the answer I was looking for there. <laughs> uh, um, well said. Yeah. Yeah. Coach Pearl, I, I want to uh, talk a little bit about your role with the team, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, I, your, your dad has been very complimentary of how the game plan is going to, he's mentioned you by, you know, Steven's done a good job of putting this game plan together for the uneducated people who really don't understand the nuance of a, like a basketball staff. Like what are the things that you're primarily responsible for when it comes to getting this team ready to play? So I would say, you know, that's a good question. I, I think, you know, the main thing, obviously every three games, you know, the coaching staff, we split, we have three scout teams. So I have one, coach Bowman has one, coach Flanagan has one. So every call it third game, you know, we have our own scout. So obviously on, on games where it's my scout, it's my primary responsibility to get the offensive and defensive game plan together and help coach out with that. But when it's not my scout, you know, my eye is, you know, heading towards probably the defensive end more than anything, trying to help our other scout teams, and they do the same thing with me when it's my scout of coming up with adjustments, because when it's your scout, you're looking at a lot of different things. And you're not able to you know, hone in on some of the few specifics. So I try and look at a few specifics when it's not my scout to help us make adjustments defensively, because BP and, and, and Mike Burgomaster handle most of the lion's share of the offense. Uh, mm-hmm. If I see a few things that we could add in offensively, I'll, I'll jump in because I've been playing in the system and, and coaching in the system the longest. Um, but as far as like what I'm doing in game, I'm trying to help us out with in game adjustments, whether it's ball screen coverage, um, mm. or just anything defensively that can help us have an, have an edge and things that I see. So, um, you know, in game, that's, that's the biggest thing, you know, obviously, uh, leading up to, to games, you know, trying to help our guys get extra shots up, you know, working in the gym with those guys, coach Bowman and coach Flanagan do an unbelievable job with that as well. We have some really good GAs that get, you know, our guys really do a good job of getting in the gym and working, mm-hmm. but then just, you know, off. You know, outside of that, just trying to be an ear to our guys and, and just listen, right? Because um, 
you know, they go through a lot on a day to day basis, sure. um, whether it's on the floor or off the floor. You know, obviously, I've, I've been in their shoes, so I can I can kind of relate to what they're going through. Um, so just trying to help them get through, you know, the intricacies of, of, of school and basketball and, and, and having to play for, for a guy like BP, um, you know, just trying to help them through that process and just trying to do everything we can to, to get us ready for the next one. Now, are, are you are you an analytics guy? Are you a guy that's like looking at plus minus stuff and you're looking at, you know, lineup arrangements of, oh, we're, this is our most efficient lineup for blah, blah, like, is that kind of a, a thing that you're into or are you just more so into the what the film, the tape says, right. As opposed to what the numbers say. Yeah. I'm a big, I'm a big numbers guy. Um, so I, I look at that a lot. I'll look at, you know, what three, three guard lineups are, are our best, what two big lineups are our best, what five man lineups are our best and our worst and, and trying to figure out, you know, how we make those adjustments in, in game. So um, it's, it, I mean, it's a big thing. It's a big part of what we do. You know, coach golden uh, introduced that to us when he first got here at Auburn nine years ago. And it's been a big part of what we've done ever since. You know, we we we, ch- we we stat all of our offensive possessions uh, to look at what play calls are working, what play calls aren't working, right? And then we we stat all of our defensive possessions to to see, you know, uh, who's struggling uh, guarding in the post, who's struggling guarding on the perimeter, who's struggling in ball screen defense. So we we stat all that stuff to try and figure out, you know, where we're struggling, where we can get better, and, and how we can improve um, throughout the season. After the loss uh, to Alabama, VP mentioned that you know. Um, Hey, listen, Missouri is a game that we have to look at where if we don't win this one, we have to start talking about whether the tournament is in play. And it may be in the pregame leading up to Missouri. I apologize. But yeah. um, the you guys get Missouri and you get it big. Uh, so you have five games left, right? You guys are on the road at, you know, in Nashville, at Vanderbilt. And, you know, what is the feeling internally about what you have to do to make sure that it's not a question about whether Auburn makes the tournament here at the end of the season with Vanderbilt, Ole Miss, Kentucky, Alabama, and, and, and Tennessee, your, your favorite team left here at the end. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's hard to really, really say, but w- what I will say is, you know, I, the Missouri win did a ton for us as far as our math goes. So mm-hmm. the net is, is it's interesting this year. So the net now takes into account margin of victory. Mm-hmm. For better or worse, right? You know, so you get penalized for beating a team that you should beat by 15. If you only beat them by eight, you drop, right? But oh. you know, on the flip side, you beat a Missouri team that you're supposed to beat by six by 33. What that does is our net jumps 10 spots. So that's that's two and a half seed lines, right? When you're looking at NCAA tournament seeding, if they're seeding it based wow. off the net. So like one game, you know, takes you from wherever they had us, whether it was an eight, nine, 10 seed to maybe a seven seed now, right. Just off one game. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, our Ken Palm number jumped 11 spots after that win. So like the analytics obviously change. And the reason why our numbers didn't get messed up when we lost five out of six, because they were all close games. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think, you know, you look at what we need to do the rest of the year, obviously, you know, the whole mentality is one game at a time, but um, just looking at it from, you know, 30,000 feet, like you probably got to win, to feel to to not we're, we're talking about not having to worry worry about it, Mike. Right. Yeah. I mean, you probably got to win. You know, at least three. Right. Right. If not four, just just to be like, all right, we're good. Like, you know, nothing's gonna gonna bump us out. So, um, but as a coach, man, you, our biggest our biggest mindset right now is we're working on trying to get good seating in the SEC tournament. Obviously, you know, you would love to be in those top four spots. You get the double buy, so you don't have to play till Friday. So. Mm-hmm. That's that's where that's what our focus is. We're trying to win. We're trying to win all of them. Like we're not we're not trying to just win three, two or three or four. We're trying to win all five. Hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you got to wor- worry about, you know, how we can get our seeding right, whether we can get, a you know, a three or a four seed in the SEC tournament. Uh, and then obviously in working towards that, that obviously helps improve your NCAA tournament seeding. Well, if you win three, uh, that means you log a win versus Tennessee, Alabama or Kentucky. Yeah, uh, I think I know the answer to this, but you had to get one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, selfishly, yeah, but winning at Alabama wouldn't, wouldn't suck either. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I, mean, I think you're not a number one team or revenge. Against yeah, no, I mean, I Which mean, one are you picking here? I think I think you can you, you, you can be happy with any one of the three. But, um, you know, the, the mind says, you know, we got to try and get all of them. You know, it's going to okay. be tough. It's a tough road. But. You know, I think we're playing good enough basketball to to put ourselves in positions to to win those games. Coach, I just kind of want to get uh, 
a sense of what's the 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 off season like for you guys? Like you guys are in. I feel like one of the tougher sports to coach just because of the way the schedule mm-hmm. is like, it's just, it's back and forth. You're, you know, you're, you literally will get off a plane, come back and then you might get like a half a day maybe. And then you're right back into the grind. Like what's the off season like for you all to try to figure out how, like, is there time to decompress as a, a college basketball coach or is it just a constant grind for you all? I mean, I get turned into a 12 month season really, which, which is crazy. Um, you know, obviously the season ends in April, um and then you know after after the season ends you know you jump now with the transfer portal like we're right into recruiting basically like the day you either win the ncw national championship or you lose in the ncw tournament you are in the portal basically trying to find because you know you got to find guys to replace guys that are either graduating or transferring out or going to the nba right. like you got to find guys so we're we're basically like as soon as the season's over we're right into recruiting so we're having you know whatever whatever we have left in official visits we're bringing guys in on visits to try and get you know those few last spots filled up um you're trying to re-recruit your roster for you know for better or worse because that that's that's the thing now um because guys are obviously you know there's there's nil opportunities at, at other right. schools that they could be getting you know talked to about they, they may not have liked their role. So, you know, you got to re-recruit your whole team and, and try and under, get them to understand like what the, what the long-term goal is. Um, so you got that last two weekends of April, we're out on the road recruiting the high school circuits. Right. So, um, and then May, you, you usually get uh, two weeks in May to kind of like, you know, get away for a little bit. If you have your roster figured out at that point, if you don't, you're still recruiting. Um, and then, you know, obviously our kids come back Memorial day weekend um our freshmen our, our our freshmen come back Memorial Day weekend our returning players come back the week before that so we're starting like workouts and weights and individuals and stuff in May and that goes all the way through May June July add camps on top of that in June mm. right recruiting in June and July then you get two weeks in August to kind of you know get away for a little bit and then the then school starts back up like August 15th and you're back into it so wow. you get a couple weeks here and there um, but with, with the landscape of, of the transfer portal and recruiting and yeah. now kids, you know, taking summer classes, which allows them to get ahead. Uh, so they're not having to take as many hours during the academic year. Um, and they get to spend time here working on their game and we get more flexibility and practices throughout the summer with four hours on the floor. Um, it really has turned into a 12 month deal, um, where, you know, you only get a couple weeks here and there to, to kind of get away. Uh, coach Pearl, there's been some chatter about um, you being a head coach and waiting when when BP hangs it up uh, is being the head coach at Auburn down the road, something that you aspire to or, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, share with us. What, what, what are what are your goals here? Uh, ultimately, Mike, Mike, I haven't heard that chatter, but I uh, have you not really, I, I really, uh, I, I'm just, I would love one day to, to obviously, you know, fill in um, and, and take over when, once coach is done. Obviously, that would be a dream of mine. That that would be the long term goal. That would be, you know, that'd be a that'd be a dream come true, um, you know, to be able to lead this program and try and build on what we've done so far. Uh, that'd be amazing, you know. Uh, but I think the biggest thing we, we got to continue to do right now is we got to worry about continuing to win and put this mm-hmm. program in position to continue to be successful because uh, we've done a great job so far, but you know, for that to happen, we got to continue to win. So, um, you know, nothing's, nothing's set in stone. Obviously it's something that obviously I would aspire to do and love to do. Um, but you know, we just got to kind of see when we, when we cross that bridge. But, but like I said, man, we, right now, the main focus is, you know, we had a taste of obviously of a few championships. We had a taste of, of a final four, like that, that's what's made us so hungry and we want to get back. So, biggest thing we can continue to worry about right now is, is just continuing to build history, um, continuing to, to bring great kids, uh, great future Auburn men into this program um, to try and give these fans a product that they can be proud of uh, and continue to support because without them, you know, th- this, this Auburn basketball thing would be nothing without the fans and without all the love and support that we've gotten so far. But, you know, long answer short, Mike, yes, I, I would love, you know, to obviously be a head coach here one day um you know so we'll just we'll just see if uh if that's something that happens you uh, got, a, got a tiny taste of it when you got to fill in for for bp uh during yeah, the right. suspension game so, right you, know, yeah. you, you kind of know what it feels like but not necessarily sitting in the chair for full time but now now steven uh we got the interview kicked off talking about 
you know, again, having a, a great father as a coach. And, you know, there are media storylines and there are fan storylines. Uh, but one of the serious things that's arisen um, in talking about uh, you and your father, there are a lot of people who feel like um, that you have surpassed your father as the best looking guy on the team. What are your thoughts <laughs> about <laughs> about the you know, BP's flexing in the in the student section of the football games? But a lot of people feel like, listen, Stephen is uh is GQ out there on the sideline. You know, oh, uh, have you have gotta, you passed your father as the best <laughs> looking guy on the team on the sideline? Man, if, the coaches. if that if that just happened, we we got a problem. I thought that happened nine years ago. <laughs> when I, signed up. I need a hot oh, take, here, Stephen. It took nine years. Take. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> All right, no, so I'll go with yes, yes, yes. You, uh, yeah, you feel like I hope it. so. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> right. with, with time and age, if if I can if I can still be moving around and have the same energy and and stuff that BP has, yeah. I, I'll be I'll be lucky. That's for sure. All Just right. Indeed. All right. Well, Stephen, I really want to thank you for joining us uh, today to talk about Auburn basketball, the state of the program. Talk about your personal goals and where you see this team going. Um, we'll be watching closely to see how Auburn finishes out the season, and we wish you guys much much success in the near future. Mike, I appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, it was a blast, and I look forward to doing it again. Guys, that's it for another great edition of Building Rapport with Coach Stephen Pearl. If you want more content like this, please hit like and subscribe. We are the War Report on every social media platform, TW Report on TikTok. Guys, we're signing off, and as always, War Eagle. War Eagle. War Eagle.